Welcome to the University of Limerick Research Impact podcast series. My speakers today hail from the School of Law and the Centre for Crime, Justice and Victim Studies here at the University of Limerick. They are Dr. Emer Spain, Senior Lecturer in Law, Dr. Susan Leahy, Director of the Centre for Crime, Justice and Victim Studies and Professor of Law Shane Kilcummins. In their research, the group are exploring the voice of the victim in the Irish criminal process. What issues in relation to victims and our justice system are you addressing through your research, Shane? We are looking at the victim in general in the Irish criminal process. In societies today, we now in Ireland, we live in what might be regarded as a a relatively high crime society. Crime is a normal social fact. Many people have experienced it. And yet when we look at the statistics underpinning crime and and how it occurs and why it occurs and who it occurs to, it kind of reveals some very interesting social phenomena. And so one of the things that may be of interest to people to begin with is a study by the European Fundamental Rights Agency in, in 2013. It looked at women in Irish society who have been abused by their partners and the statistics themselves They're shocking, but also very revealing. They suggest that one in three women have been subjected to psychological abuse by their partners and one in six have been subjected to physical abuse. So those statistics, as I mentioned already, they're both shocking, but also revealing. They're revealing in in the sense that they demonstrate the extent to which crime is a normal social fact, um, but also perhaps the extent to which much of it is hidden and isn't revealed or discussed in our society. And so that is interesting for me as a researcher because we, the team, began to trace victims in the Irish criminal process. And the status of being a victim hasn't remained constant over time. It has changed and altered irrevocably. And I suppose to start with, in the 17th and 18th centuries, the victim was the key stakeholder. So he or she gathered the evidence, they presented the evidence in court, they gathered witnesses, they owned the conflict. And what actually happened throughout the course of the 19th century and early 20th centuries is that the state monopolized crime. So it was the state through the police and one of the first centralized police agencies in the world was in Dublin, 1789. State also monopolized prosecution. Again, one of the first centralized prosecution agencies in the world was in Dublin in 1801. So they took ownership of the conflict and so they took it away from the victim and the whole process became much more institutionalized and rule bound. And so what actually happened, so the previous model was called an exculpatory model. The accused didn't have a right to silence. They were in court. They had to tell their story when the victim told his or her story. And so what actually happened then when the state took over the conflict, it became a state versus accused game and lawyers were representing the accused. And the first thing that the lawyer did with the accused was shut the accused up. So the state the big leviathan versus the accused represented by a lawyer. And what that actually meant for the victim was that he or she was displaced. So they no longer owned the conflict. They had no longer any control of it. They may not even be needed at all in the process. So they may not be needed as a, even as a witness. And so they wouldn't be told what was happening. They wouldn't be told when it was happening. And the, their ownership rights were completely removed. And that really was the entire discourse and the entire practice from about the 1840s I would say it's only now in the last 20, 30 years that we're beginning to see inroads into that and how it's changing. And so that's an interesting phenomenon and, you know, where we locate the victim in that. But it's also as a lawyer and as an academic, it's interesting that, you know, when I was taught as a lawyer, I was taught about accused rights. So so the, the social reality was for me was a state versus accused. We never looked behind that. And it's all about the rules. So it's presented as if it's bloodless and that there is no social reality behind the rules. So increasingly, you just kind of began to pick away at that and see that this conflict, you know, although we've presented it as state versus accused, there is a third party in the conflict. And that's the person to whom this incident occurred. And so we're just looking at the variety of ways then in which the victim is being reintroduced into the criminal process. How? We're looking at some of the obstacles, particularly around fairness of procedures. We're looking about how they can be reaccommodated. Uh, we're particularly looking at arguments that are being made by the accused party in terms of fairness procedures and so on. And so sometimes the argument is presented that, you know, that this is all part of a more punitive logic of action that, you know, gains for victims is at the expense of accused and the system is becoming more punitive. But when we look at it in that historical context, what we see a lot more from my perspective, and I think Susan Niemer would say the same, is that 
there's a brilliant social commentator by the name of Jürgen Habermas, and he talks about the juridification of new forms of inclusion. And so we see children having rights now that we may not have had ourselves as children. And so I think victims is another part, another stakeholder who are part of this momentum towards a new form of inclusion. And so what we're doing really is mapping how that's occurring, where it's occurring, how it's occurring. And so it's descriptive, but it's also normative why it ought to be occurring. So that's what we're doing. I suppose one thing that fascinates me is to how the status of victim is changing. And we're looking at the causal factors behind that. And I think Ireland is really, really interesting in that regard. So, you know, this movement away from the state accused model of criminal justice, I think it began post Second World War with the rise of victimology. And so many people may not be aware of this, but they've heard the phrase criminology. And so criminology looks at the offender and why he or she committed the crime. That was the dominant again, penal discourse from about 1895 right up to the present day. But it was looking at how to change the offender, how to make the offender better. But what we began to see, starting very slowly, was the victim. Why did the crime occur to the victim? And what are his or her needs and concerns? And I'm pleased to say that we've introduced victimology as a module here at the University of Limerick. I think it's the first module of its kind in Ireland, specifically looking at victims of crime. And the centre also includes victims in its title. So what you'll see in Ireland is you'll see very often you'll see centres for criminal justice or institutes of criminology. But they're really much focused on it's either accused or offender. We're interested in accusing offenders as well. But we're also introducing into that discourse the idea that there are victims as well and all need to be considered when we're looking at evidence based policy. Their voice also needs to be heard. So that's one example of where it's changed. Mass victimization surveys have also helped. They only started in Ireland in the 1990s. So you see Central Statistics Office and so on beginning to go into people's homes and recording what's happened. Have there been incidents and so on? And so one of the things that that's revealed, starting in the US in the 70s, England and Wales in the 80s, in Ireland in the 1990s, but what it revealed for the first time is there are more crimes occurring than the official statistics. So most people, it's estimated that maybe one in four, one in five don't report a crime. And then for sexual offences and so on, that can even be higher. And so the official statistics then don't reveal the full extent of crime. So uh, this began to change, I suppose, debate around victims of crime. The third issue that's important is the women's movement. So they began to raise consciousness, particularly around physical and sexual violence. And so we see the first domestic abuse shelter being set up in Dublin in 1974, followed in 1977 by the first rape crisis centre. Now, that's relatively late in terms of the long history of the criminal process. But you can see just beginning for the first time then to raise the voice of women in the criminal process. And again, that's part of the, the broader momentum. I think in Ireland, one of the issues that became very important and again, you know, I teach evidence law and evidence law, you would think, well, wouldn't be much of a social window into practices in Ireland. But one of the issues I talk about is delaying in criminal proceedings and how, you know, after a you know, certain amount of time, cases can't be heard. But from 1993 onwards, and it was literally like a light bulb had been switched on. You see hundreds of cases coming before the courts about people who had been sexually abused in their childhood who had kept it a secret for 20, 30, 40 years. And so that had to do with the dominance of the church. It had to do with fear factor, not being believed. And I think it was probably after the Brendan Smith affair and so on, that for the first time in the mid-1990s, about 1993, that you see people beginning to take cases for the first time. So you can document that literally through hundreds and hundreds of cases. Rising crime rates. One of the things that, you know, in Western criminal justice systems, we believed we'd win the war on crime. So particularly in post-Second World War in England and Wales and the US, the idea was through criminology and making the offender better, we would win the war on crime. But what's actually happened by the 1990s and particularly the 1980s was statistics kept rising. So no matter how much money we pumped into making offenders better, crime rates were increasing. And so the idea then became as well, if we can't win the war on crime, what can we actually do? And so it was natural that the lens then would turn to say, well, we can do things for victims. So, you know, the police, prosecutors and so on, they can give services to victims. They can take them into account. They can provide a better, more effective service for them by actually looking at their needs and concerns. That was something that was winnable as opposed to rising crime rates. That also constituted a change. I suppose one of the interests that was hugely important for me, and I just assure you, I think this is a kind of a really good way of looking at how exclusionary the state versus accused system was. So in 1986 in Ireland, in a case, this young woman with Down syndrome was watching a program with her mother on the television. And the program was about incest. It was a a drama. 
And at the end of the program, she turned around to her mother. She was 18. She turned around to her mother and she said, I'm really delighted that the man in that program was prosecuted. And her mother began to question her and said, why are you so delighted about this? And she revealed that her own father was carrying out um, sexual abuse on her. And so he was being prosecuted then for this incident. Remember, I was talking about this state versus accused system. So when he went to court, he was accused of this and he said, my daughter can't give evidence against me because she is an intellectual disability. So she's incompetent to testify. My wife can't give evidence against me because of marital privacy. So she's also incompetent to testify. So that was the accused model, that it was all of the rights and all of the procedures and in terms of determining fairness were, I wouldn't say loaded in favor of the accused, but they were just entirely orientated that way. And so for the first time in Ireland, Mr. Justice Walsh, a Supreme Court judge, said, well, look, this is ridiculous. We have a constitution and the constitution protects the family under Article 41. So those common law rules, which we've inherited, you know, from the common law system, they have to be struck down on that basis because they're just not good enough. So that was the first time ever that we see a victim being recognized as, as late as 1986 that you see a victim being recognized. Now, that was just on a it was still on an ad hoc sporadic basis, but you're seeing them being reintroduced. And I think one of the things for me, why I became interested in victims of crime was for 15 years, I was teaching evidence rules to lawyers, both in UCC here in UL, but also in the Law Society of Ireland. And I'm talking to them about the rules and the exclusionary rules around hearsay, the presumption of innocence, the burden of proof, competence and compatibility. And really then, um, I started to look at the statistics, particularly for persons with disabilities in the criminal process, and the attrition rates for people with disabilities, particularly in sexual abuse cases, is horrendous. And so looking at the social reality behind that, that why, you know, very often they're deemed incompetent to testify at the start because the system is so adversarial and is so orientated to, you know, speaking in court. So it's almost discriminatory in, the, in its approach to such persons, because if you can't say it in court, it doesn't count. But some people, obviously, because of, say, perhaps a disability that they have, that they can't articulate in that way. And so it started that simply, just beginning to look behind that, looking at statistics, looking at the social reality of people's lives, the ontological dimensions of disability and so on, and seeing that perhaps the criminal process just isn't as objective or neutral or value free as I would have thought that a lot more accommodation needs to be going on, that very often as lawyers what we tend to do is reify the rules and the precedents which may be going back 150 years and not looking at the social reality behind them and not looking even at when we talk about unfairness, where is the actual unfairness? How is this unfair to the accused? Through our work, I think that's one of the things we've been really trying to walk that tight line between ensuring fairness for the accused and the integrity of the criminal process and the integrity of the decision-making process, but at the same time testing fairness. And so a lot of the work has been based around that. So, Susan, I'll bring you in here. Shane referred to the issues in relation to the underreporting of crime victims with disabilities and women in the criminal process. How are your research group addressing these issues? I suppose at the outset, it's important to explain the type of lawyers we are. So Shane and Emer and I would all be of a sociolegal orientation. And what that basically means is we're not just rule bound lawyers. I think from listening to Shane's introduction, that's very clear. So we're very interested in how the law impacts on the society it works in and that symbiotic relationship I suppose between the society and the law which is very important for victims of crime. So our approach is very much looking at not just desk based research where we look at the laws and how they can be better but also empirical research so finding out actually how organisations are working in the area, the problems they're encountering and how we can help them. So whether that is through writing a policy submission for them to go to government or finding out things that are impacting upon them and doing research that will help them to solve the problems um, they're encountering day to day. So I suppose our approach has almost always been not just academic and traditional academic for uh, like writing academic articles or textbooks, but also having on the ground impact on policy and talking to NGOs and government bodies, but really having a close relationship with all the key stakeholders in the criminal justice system. So your work is informing parliamentary debate and policy. I mean, have you had feedback from those stakeholders in relation to how that is making a difference for them? 100%. So we have had, I suppose, the best evidence of our impact is, first of all, our work is getting published in all the traditional places. So we're being published in national and international journals. We have a book forthcoming at Manchester University Press, which 
I think is very innovative in the sense that we're not just looking forward, but we're looking back. So we're tracing the trajectory of the victim in the way Shane has discussed from being a player to being ignored to now becoming very much a player again. And there are really good lessons to be learned from looking back as well as looking forward. We've had conferences here. We had a big conference, Victims' Rights and Agenda for Change in 2015, which I think really showed the centre as a centre for excellence in this area. And it is rare in academic conferences that you have academics and then all the stakeholders from the police, probation services, the judiciary and office of the DPP, and then all the relevant NGOs, all those victims' organisations coming together and having a conversation about how we can do things better. And that was under the shadow of the Victims Directive becoming live a few months later. And there were some really interesting conversations that continue now and we continue to do work either on a pro bono basis or a funded basis for some of those organisations. In terms of funding, we are being highly successful in securing funding both at EU level and at national level. So quite recently we received €99,000 to fund postdoctoral research from the Irish Council of Civil Liberties and the Irish Research Council. We can see the impact on policy and practice. Our, our research has been mentioned in Dáil and Shannon debates. That's a very clear indication that not only are we sending the work into government departments, but that government departments are reading it. And you have to get to a certain place before these people are going to listen to you. So I think that has been one of the foremost indicators that we're getting where we want to go. And I know for myself personally, I do a pro bono work for Dublin Rape Crisis Centre and for ADAPT. And I think that to me has been a really valuable experience in having a skill and being able to help the community you're living in. At the end of the day, we all have the potential to be a victim of crime. And at some small level, probably all of us will be a victim of crime at some stage, whether our house gets burgled or our car gets stolen. And then the system hits you in the face. So I think it is a really live community issue. And I do think that the impact on the community is something we've been very alive to and also bring our work to the public. So national and local um, radio writing opinion pieces in newspapers because at the end of the day research in a university isn't much use if the community don't know it's there and how it can benefit them. So Imar, I'll bring you in here. Where do you see the research going in the future? Where to from here for your research group? So there has been great progress in accommodating victims within the criminal justice sector in recent times, but there still remains a lot of work to be done to ensure the realisation of the rights of victims within the Irish criminal justice sector. And I think Where we fit in or our role, I suppose, is to provide accurate, comprehensive and reliable data on victims and their experience within the Irish criminal justice system. And I think the absence of that data of that quality, which is reliable and comprehensive, is well documented within Ireland. So I suppose we see our role as trying to identify what is happening on the ground with victims. What is their experience when they engage with the criminal justice sector, whether it's with uh, Angarda Siakana or with service providers? particularly those who choose not to engage with a formal authority following a crime, their experience of a crime. We're also interested, I suppose, in the really high rates of underreporting and attrition within the jurisdiction. So, for example, just 28% of women who have experienced intimate partner violence will report the most serious incident to formal authorities. So if we have really high rates of women being subject to violence and really, uh, you know, up to 72 percent of those that cohort not reporting. There is a huge number of victims in Ireland who are not engaging with the system. When we're looking at attrition, even individuals who do report their crimes to a formal authority, we find them slipping through the net and falling out of the system. Again, for example, a 2009 study on sexual violence in Ireland found that just one third of cases which were open to prosecution were prosecuted within the jurisdiction. So I suppose we're interested not just in the absolute numbers of victims and the number of victims who are reporting, but we're also interested in why victims aren't reporting and why they're falling out of the net. And I suppose that's really important. Is it because of a lack of faith in the system? Is it because, you know, they fear re from engagement with, you know, the, the system, whether that's on Garda Shikon or prosecution services. And I think that understanding and that knowledge will be really important in developing public policy, in decisions around funding in the future and in infrastructure development. And that research 
will enable us to put forward proposals on reform in the area where we think funding should be directed, where it's needed, where it can most help victims or most assist them. But I think we're also interested in looking at innovative policy developments abroad. What is happening abroad? For example, could we look at an ombudsman for victims? How would that help the victim? Could that encourage better practice within the system? Can we look at, you know, witness care centres where there's kind of an integrated approach to victims involving everyone within the criminal justice sector from, you know, the court service to the director of public prosecutions to Angarda Siakana. But I think beyond the research, and I suppose this gets back to the point that Susan has just made about the fact that we're very interested in how law operates in society. And I suppose we're very interested not just in in the paper based research, but also in training. So I think one of the big problems with the current system that has been identified in, in previous research is around the fact that victims are re-traumatized often through their engagement with the system. And again, that was very clear from research that I did with CUSC and the Office for the Prevention of Domestic, Sexual and Gender Based Violence and the experience of service users within that sector. They were re-traumatized and further upset through engagement with the courts and Angarda Shikona. So we're interested in kind of ensuring that people who have face to face contact with victims, who engage with them, treat them in a respectful, sensitive manner and, and have an understanding of how best to engage with and minimise any further upset and trauma. You've been listening to Professor Shane Kilcommons, Dr. Susan Leahy and Dr. Emer Spain of the School of Law and the Centre for Crime, Justice and Victim Studies at UL. This research is supported by CUSC the National Office for the Prevention of Domestic, Sexual and Gender-Based Violence in the Department of Justice, the Commission for the Support of Victims of Crime, the National Disability Authority, the Irish Research Council, the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, the European Commission and the Equality Authority. If you'd like to find out more about Research Impact or to read our full case study on this research, go to our website, ul.ie forward slash research impact.